A close careful look at the passenger list might give us some clues. There are more top secret security clearances here on this passenger list than there are in most medium sized cities in America. Especially astounding on this bizarre passenger list is the preponderance of Navy personnel amongst the four armed services and a tilt toward propulsion and guidance systems among all the possible secret technologies. One of those systems was an onboard warning and control system which could take control of any commercial aircraft and fly it by remote control. AWACS was developed by Systems Planning Corporation, a company owned by Bush's good friend Dov Zakheim. The prevailing conspiracy theory is that the planes were hijacked and flown into the buildings by remote control. This is further supported by the final flight maneuvers performed by the second plane to strike the World Trade Center. Since every amateur videographer in New York City had their cameras pointed up at the burning Tower 1, the second plane strike was filmed from nearly every conceivable angle. Expert analysis of this plane leads to some startling revelations. First, there is the expertly controlled flight characteristics of this plane. During its last 20 seconds of flight, UA-175 made a single corrective maneuver so perfectly timed and executed that it could not possibly have been piloted by human hands. Then there is the extra piece of equipment on the underside of the plane. This was analyzed by several experts who confirmed that it was not a shadow, but a Barton Marietta AWACS flight controller mounted underneath the front of the plane. One of the things that jumped out at me when I looked at the, uh, the footage of the video of uh, Flight 175 as it went into the uh, World Trade Center is it appeared to me that there was something on the under fuselage of that aircraft that did not belong there, at least not with a commercial airliner. Now, uh, I'll tell you where I have seen uh, uh, attachments that, that uh, look like that on military aircraft. So the question we have to answer now is, was that the commercial airliner that hit the World Trade Center? Or possibly was it an aircraft that looked very similar, but was a military uh, type airplane? All the recorded sources, all the different photographic evidence uh, that was produced by CNN and, and ABC, they all show this pod. It, it's there, you can see it with your own eyes. And in my professional opinion, that, that there was a pot attached to that, the bottom of that aircraft, and uh, therefore it was not United Airlines Flight 175. They attacked loose change so severely for bringing this up that they actually got a lot of people to back off of it. Shortly after, they began a massive no plane theory disinformation campaign to further obfuscate the truth. They would have their agents pose as conspiracy theorists and go on TV and radio shows to misrepresent the 9-11 truth movement, creating turbulence within and ridicule from the outside. According to Mike Ballone, a 9-11 rescue worker at Ground Zero who actually physically saw one of the black box flight data recorders taken from the World Trade Center rubble, said the FBI then confiscated the evidence and warned people not to talk about what they saw. Now the official government story denies that they found any of the black boxes, however if you look at every plane crash in aviation history they always find the black boxes. Obviously these black boxes contain information that the government doesn't want the public to see. So what really did happen to these planes? If you take a careful look at the flight paths of American Airlines 11 and UA-175, the two flights that took off from Boston's Logan Airport and crashed into the Twin Towers, you'll find a major clue. X marks the spot on this treasure map, as it turns out that not only did both these planes cross paths directly over Stewart Air Force Base, but they did so at the exact same time. Another odd synchronicity is Flight 93, which had been sitting on the tarmac delayed at the airport for nearly 40 minutes with no explanation. Originally scheduled to take off at 8.01 a.m., it was delayed until the moment that Flight AA-11 crashed into the North Tower at 8.43 a.m. It would appear that Flight 93 was their backup plane in case one of the other flights was intercepted. After all, you've got two towers rigged for demolition, you can't take the chance that one of these planes gets intercepted. Another interesting piece of evidence that ties Stewart Air Force Base to the center of this 9-11 conspiracy is the white mystery planes spotted over Washington and the Pentagon. Through careful investigation, we've been able to map out the flight paths of these two ominous aircraft, which have been identified as E-4Bs, a type of aircraft that the military uses as mobile command posts. What concerns me is that both of these aircraft took off from and landed at Stewart Air Force Base. Finally, none of this could have ever happened if NORAD and our military air defenses hadn't been deliberately dismantled. The planes would have been shot out of the sky much like Flight 93 appears to have been. Rumsfeld took away military authority to shoot down civilian airlines in June of 2001 and gave it back again in November. 
Operations Vigilant Warrior, Vigilant Guardian, Northern Vigilance, and Northern Guardian were military exercises that involved sending all our air defenses to Canada to fight an imaginary Russian fleet, placing false radar blips onto FAA radar, and running hijacked plane scenarios which effectively left the military with only four planes to defend the entire northeast sector, while the FAA at one point had as many as 22 hijacked aircraft on radar to deal with. Under normal circumstances, NORAD would have responded to a hijacked aircraft within an average of about 11 to 14 minutes. Um, I wanted to focus just a moment on the uh, Presidential Emergency Operating Center. <clears throat> you were there uh, for a good part of the day. I think you were there with the Vice President. And uh, we had that order given, I think it was by the President, that uh, authorized uh, the shooting down of commercial aircraft that were suspected to be controlled by terrorists. Um, were you there when that order was given? No, I, I was not. I was made aware of it uh, during the time that the airplane coming in to the Pentagon, uh, there was a young man who would come in and say to the vice president, the, the plane is 50 miles out, the plane is 30 miles out. And when it got down to the plane is 10 miles out, uh, the young man also said to the vice president, do the orders still stand? And uh, the vice president turned and whipped his neck around and said, of course the orders still stand. Have you heard anything to the contrary? Well, at the time I didn't know what all that meant. And... Um, the flight you're referring to is the the One. flight that came into the Pentagon. Pentagon. Yeah. And uh, so uh, I was not aware that that discussion had already taken place. And uh, But in listening to the conversation between the young man and, and the vice president, uh, then uh, uh, at the time I didn't really recognize the significance of that. And then later I, I heard of the fact that the airplanes had been scrambled from Langley to come up to D.C., but those planes were still about 10 minutes away. And so then at the time we heard about the, the airplane that went into Pennsylvania, then I thought, oh my God, did we shoot it down. Given all of these facts, which I encourage you to investigate for yourselves, who can we conclude was most likely the mastermind behind 9-11? Do you still think it was just Al-Qaeda? Or could Al-Qaeda really be al qaeda Of course, it wasn't the whole CIA, just an elite group of well-connected opportunists. Alvin Bernard, or Buzzy Krongard, was third in the CIA before 9-11, and was connected to a firm that purchased put options on American and United Airlines during the week leading up to 9-11. Options were also placed on Merrill Lynch, one of the largest World Trade Center tenants. This is clear evidence of insider trading and foreknowledge, connected directly with the CIA. Krongard is also connected with Eric Prince of Blackwater, another company that made a fortune off the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. The Bin Laden Construction Group was hired to build permanent U.S. bases in Iraq, so the Bin Laden family benefited from 9-11 as well. Osama, the black sheep of the family, was a small price to pay, considering the benefits. The Bush and Bin Laden families have been friends and business partners through the Carlyle Group for over 25 years. The Bush family can also be connected to nearly every single facet of the 9-11 conspiracy, from the very conception of Al-Qaeda and the Mujahideen under the Carter administration, where George Bush Sr. was Director of Central Intelligence, to the Iran-Contra scandal where he was Vice President under Reagan. In fact, George H.W. Bush is the only person to ever be Vice President, President, and Director of the CIA. The day of 9-11, George H.W. Bush was meeting with Osama bin Laden's brother, Shafig bin Laden, on Carlisle Group Business at the Ritz-Carlton Hotel in Washington. While all other flights were grounded that day, the bin Laden family was allowed to fly out of the country. Chief Pakistan spy General Mahmoud Ahmed also met with Bush administration officials the week before 9-11. Ahmed also met with Bob Graham and Porter Goss on the morning of 9-11. These are the core facts of the 9-11 conspiracy, and I encourage you to do your own research into them as well. It's pretty obvious that the people in control of this puppet government will never give us a real investigation into 9-11, as all their final reports have been replete with omissions, distortions, and lies. It is up to we the people to form organized, nonviolent resistance movements for the truth. We are soldiers in a new type of warfare.
information warfare.